a thank you to Hilder, Powell's daughter, Margaret Galbraith, Claire Travis Brazel, and all of the members of Transition 10 who have helped put this together. I also want to acknowledge at this time Landmark's partners in the performing arts. These are the people and foundations and organizations who help underwrite everything we do and they make it possible for us to put together these kinds of programs. Our partners are the Peter and Jerry DeJana Foundation, the Peter and Dorette Foreman Foundation, Harding Real Estate, the town of North Hampstead, and the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Shelter Rock. So thank you all for supporting Landmark and in turn for supporting all of these community action programs. The Climate Action Series, for those of you who are new to us, is this is the second in a five part series. The next three are coming up every, they come up every two weeks on Thursdays. They're on Landmark's website and you hear from Transition Town about them as well. We have the goal to introduce community-centered climate solutions and promote individual action. Um, I'm happy to see our presenter, our guest from our first series, Karenna Gore, uh, has joined us this evening. So welcome, Karenna. We had a great conversation with uh, Karenna two weeks ago on climate resilience. All of these programs are recorded on Zoom and are will be made available on Landmark's YouTube channel and for each successive program, you will see the link to the YouTube video from the previous one, so you won't miss anything. Also, Hilda will be telling you later that how she and Transition Town will share resources from tonight's program. So we really hope that this is the start and the middle, but certainly not the end of a great conversation on saving our planet and, uh, and our climate. I want to introduce, I'll start by introducing our host for the evening, Dr. Hilda Powell's daughter. She's a climate activist, she's a parent, she's a community organizer, she's a public speaker, and the co founder of Rewild Long Island. And she, her credentials and her commitment to this, uh, this well, climate, the environment, they go on and on. And I'll embarrass her if I just keep talking about her. So please uh, join me in welcoming. Dr. Hilda Powell's daughter. Thanks, Laura. Thanks so much for having me here. And thanks everyone for taking the time and being here. And I, I want to acknowledge Gina Saletti is here as well. Um, we have, um, our electeds are actually in town hall right now and there are a few other community meetings. So I'm really thrilled with the participation that we have. And we do have, uh, an even a wider range in that this is recorded and um, will be shared. And I know uh, people in other time zones who will be listening in later. It, this is a conversation I want to be having, a conversation about regeneration. Uh, rewilding is uh, something close to my heart. And, uh, and it's interesting to talk about things that are real in this sort of uh, Zoom setting, but I've been able to make real connections in this time of uh, physical distancing. So we've been, you know, socially, we've been communing in this Zoom way, and and we've been able to cross uh, some geographical uh, boundaries in this way. And and I really hope tonight feels real and authentic to you. Regeneration is the act of allowing Earth to recover. Uh, restoring right relationship with earth and each other. When we recover our senses and start giving back to earth, the favor is returned. You may have uh, heard this quote by Buckminster Fuller that you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Well, in this case, we don't really have to reinvent the wheel as much as we need to reconnect and rediscover the right relationship to life. In grassroots circles, we agree that sustainability is not enough anymore. We cannot sustain a sick society. We must regenerate, replenish, restore, and recover what's natural within us and uh, around us. And that's why I'm pleased to be here and uh, with you all and with three pathfinders, pioneers really, in, in living uh, in natural ways. 
and being part of the regeneration movement here in our suburban setting is, is where we begin. Uh, so we are here to create a community that's interested in carving out a new path or perhaps rediscover an old path in this new environment. The 21st century, post peak oil. At Transition Town, Port Washington, we are interested in building a resilient community while turning away from fossil fuels. We are interested in being part of the soil, Ocean. So that's my word play for tonight. I'll stop here. Uh, but I, I read somewhere, soil ocean, the solution to climate crisis is in the ground, right beneath your feet. And uh, with me here tonight are three individuals who are really skilled in this relationship to the soil and restoration. Uh, Marisa de Dominicis, can you pin her, Kelly? I hope my, um, um, yes, so Marisa is executive director and co-founder of Earth Matter New York, where the mission is to reduce waste misdirected in the garbage stream by encouraging neighbor participation and leadership in composting. We also have with us tonight Wes Gillingham, who runs Wild Roots Farms with his family. He is co-founder and associate director of Catskills Mountain Keepers. And in support of New York Renews, he's dedicated to pushing New York into a just transition away from fossil fuels while protecting the ecological integrity of the Catskills region. He serves on the advisory board of the Center for Earth Ethics and Northeast Organic Farmers Association of uh, New York. And we also have with us Daniel Firth Griffith, an emergent conservationist, author, and regenerative farmer at Timshell Wildland, a 400-acre emergent and process-led landscape and farm in Central Virginia. And uh, you may have noticed that Jesse is not here. Jesse McDougall, um, a regenerative farmer in Vermont, uh, sadly could not be with us tonight due to a family emergency, but we hope to have him back at another time. So the conversation today, um, I would like to begin with Wes, actually, who is uh, close by here in the Catskills. And um, I believe we're all pinned right now. So um, I just want to invite you to meet our community and perhaps describe how you've lived away from uh, you're, you, you do not rely on fossil fuels in your daily life, Wes. Uh, well, certainly as little as possible. Um, uh, hi, everybody. It's great to see this many people come on to the Zoom. Uh, I want to um, start with some photographs, and I'm just going to go through so you can get a sense of where I live and how I live. Um, and in that, I'll tell a little bit of the story of uh, my relationship with this place and how um, my interest in soil began and how it um, is enhanced every time I turn around. Um, are we able to go to the screen share and get the photos up? Let's see if that works. Are you seeing my screen? Yes. So that's an aerial photograph of our farm. Um, it's a bit of an outdated photograph. There's some changes that have been made in there, but that, that was about, uh, I actually got this photograph because I was um, flying over the fracking fields in Pennsylvania to get some of the first aerial photographs of, the, of fracking in the east. Um, and on the way back to the airport, I got the pilot to fly over our house. So. Um, that's where this photo comes from, and that that shows you that we're you know we're it's hard to tell in that picture, but we're on the top of a ridge at about 2,000 feet in the Catskills. If you go to the next slide, um, this is where we grow all of our own food. So this is this is just our winter harvest for ourselves. This isn't you know headed to market. This is the the store the rutabagas that, and the cabbage. Um, multiple kinds of cabbage um, that we store in our root cellar all winter. Next slide. Our farm 
has animals. It's not just a vegetable garden. We're not vegetarians. Our farm has um, animals. This is one of the ways that we don't use fossil fuels. These, this, you're actually looking at multiple lawnmowers here. Um, <laughs> and um, we have um, cattle in the next slide. Um, we have Icelandic sheep, Scottish black-faced sheep, and Shetland sheep. And all of these animals are actually what enable us to farm where we are. If you look at a soil, the, the soil conservation, um, the soil map of Sullivan County, um, and they, there's class one soil, class two soil, and then there's all these subcategories within those classes. Class one soil is, you know, top of the line, river bottom soil, sandy loam, really fertile. We're in a class six zone. So if you look in the, the, the book about soil, it's, a, it's like it doesn't recommend it for maple syrup production. Basically, we have 4.6 pH soil. It's really acidic soil. It's at 2000 feet, so it's a shorter growing season. It's, um, it is a hard pan there. It's not any place where you would choose to farm if you were a smart farmer and going out to look for a farm. But we're here because this is a piece of land uh, that my parents bought um, back in the 50s for a really cheap price because it was so far from the road and there was no road frontage. Um, but the animals enable us to um, compost that and, and add to the soil so that we can grow vegetables. To show the next slide. And oops, other direction. Um, and both of those sets of animals um, are really hardy breeds. They're heritage breeds. Um, Scottish Highland cattle are one of the oldest breeds of cattle in the world. They're up there with the ax and Watusi cattle in terms of just they're really ancient breeds. They can survive on pasture that your average modern Holstein would get very skinny on. Um, so this is an aerial view of the farm um, today um, in the fall. And if you look at that, it doesn't look like what the average person would see as a, you know, the farm, the barn, and then this really highly cultivated um, field. We have the house in the middle there, and then there is um, a garden where our vegetables, and there's a hoop house um, and another garden. But if you look down in the center bottom of the field, you see this slight transition from grass to some trees, and then it turns into this brushy area. And that's what we have done over time. That brushy area is what naturally happens in a, a field setting where um, you stop cutting the trees down and in the northeast with the rain and um, all the ecosystem that is around there you get a transition well what we've been doing is cultivating a transition in that not going out there and cultivating the soil but encouraging certain things to grow taking the hard hack out here and there but that that whole bottom of that picture is a huge blueberry patch all wild blueberries. We didn't go to the store and buy those. We've just lived there long enough um, that we've been able to encourage them. You go to the next slide. Oop. So th that, you know, that brings up the um, technical difficulty, but um, that brings up the topic of as a farmer, and you can talk about the science, you can talk to a soil scientist, you can get soil tests, you can do all these um, um, scientific analysis, but it's really about building a re relationship with a place and learning what uh, that place can provide for you or with, with you. Um, that um, style of farming, you know, there's there's names, and that's you're going to learn about the you know the definition of regenerative farming. Um, and it's all about, um, it's not, to me, it's never been the name. It's about the relationships that you come up with. Permaculture is, somebody could come to our farm and say, oh, you're a permaculture farm. Oh, you're doing ready-generated farming. Oh, are you organic? Um, and we're just a family that's developing a relationship with a place and learning. I've known this piece of land my entire life. Um, yeah. so I've had the opportunity um, to learn its personality. Um, can and, that, and, and can I can I ask you about I remember you you speaking about three extreme weather events that changed the sort of course of your professional life. 
and, and uh, floods related to climate uh, change? Yeah, so um, the, the th what happened was I was teaching college and traveling around the country. And then my wife and I decided to start farming because we were in this place, living on this, this place. I decided to stop teaching college and farming. So we started a, a CSA. We ran 150 family CSA for multiple years. Uh, we grew vegetables on a river bottom flat, um, 10 acres of river bottom and um, built a CSA. Now that, the thing that I learned from that, what I was just talking about is the relationship with the land. Um, one of the things you, I, I was talking about the science and the, the soil um, agroecology, there's all these words, but we had someone working with us who was really excited about this bare fallow system. And it's the idea of going out and plowing um, multiple times and, and cultivating multiple times over the years. So you, you keep weeds out of your farm. Um, well, I was used to the land up on the ridge that I was showing you pictures of. And when we were doing a bare fallow system on just one section of our field down below in the sandy loam, by the end of the season, um, I was planting every two weeks another 180 feet of, of beans for plant picking later in the season. And every um, time I planted a patch of beans, I cultivated the rest of the field. And by the end of the summer, we had this huge section of beans, but the first few beds that I had, um, had started cultivating, basically I, I burnt that whole patch of the field because it was sandy loam and it drained so well and just the ecosystem and the relationship of the soil in that place. Um, I, uh, I oxidized most of the organic matter in that soil. That was not how to farm in that place, but it took me to see that um, and, and try this new method of, of farming and controlling weeds and it totally backfired. It works for people in clay soils, but it doesn't work there. That field, um, uh, we learned how to work with that field using cover crops and ro rotating our crops. And we had a whole um, crop rotation system. And that was our living for many years until we had 200 year floods and a 500 year flood in a five year period. I'll say that again, 200 year and a 500 year flood in five years. Um, yes. So for those who don't know what that means, that means, uh, you know, you'd expect that type of extreme weather event every hundred years or every 500 years, but that happened within just a couple of years, right? Yeah. So the, I mean, we're talking the 500 year flood took out all of our irrigation equipment. It drowned two of our tractors. Uh, it took down our fencing. Um, and that was a leased ground. So we moved up on the ridge away from that field um, and started putting our investment more into the farm where we were. And that was, that was the beginning of Catskill Mountain Keeper um, because of the, um, I mean, the climate issue became very apparent. It wasn't something that was happening um, in the future. It was something that is happening right now. So, uh, you know, and we saw the, the direct impact of that. Um, but so can we get those pictures, the last few pictures back up? Yeah. And, and that's, um, you know, you've basically shown resilience on your farm. Do you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, good. So this, what? What? this photo just, I, I stuck this in there simply for the reason that if you treat your soil well, um, it, it, there, there's a, a direct payback. Um, how's that for a, a, um, a collard leaf and, and broccoli? Um, go to the next. next wow. One. <laughs> and and I, was, I was mentioning learning to live in a place and, and learning. My wife and I were sitting around trying to figure out what kind of what do we need to plant in front of the um, in front of the porch. And we didn't get around to it that year. And we said, oh, what are we going to plant? We planted a couple little things, but then all of a sudden 
up comes these little seedlings and we were able to recognize this, this little seedling and we did not plant either of those elderberry bushes, which has given, given us um, much abundance over the, over the years. Um, and there's elderberries all over now. Um, they, they keep spreading. Birds love elderberries. We don't get all the elderberries and the birds help, help us plant them. Um, and that was one of the things too, that you know, when you have a relationship with the land, um, you get to learn um, really fun things that you can do. I was, tell, I was talking the other day about how when we were growing vegetables down at the field and we had, we had a little bit of an issue with um, the cabbage worm, the, um, the cabbage moths fly in and then they lay their eggs on the cabbage and broccoli and collards and kale. And then you, all of those vegetables end up with a bunch of holes. Um, and, and if it's a really bad infestation, people don't want to buy that when you're selling vegetables at a farmer's market. Yeah. But if you put up a bunch of bluebird houses around your field, bluebirds love nailing those uh, moths in the air. And then they'll hop around your cabbage and around your kale and eat the, the cabbage worm. You won't eradicate the worms. They won't be gone. They'll still be around here and there but you won't have the damage that really um, hurts your, um, your plants. Next, go to the next slide if you can. I wanted to finish on, on this slide before I jump to the, the politics of it all. Um, and I'll just read this if you can't see it that well. Um, oop, it grew, so I won't be, okay. So once upon a time when women were birds, there was a simple understanding that to sing at dawn and to sing at dusk was to heal the world through joy. The, burl, the birds still remember what we have forgotten. The world is meant to be celebrated. Um, I love that picture. That's my daughter. I love that picture. And I, and I love that. It's a Terry Tempest Williams quote. Um, and I love that because um, all this that we're talking about, and you're gonna learn more about as we go on with this story about composting and regenerative soil, but it's all about reconnecting with where you are, wherever it, um, you all, you know, a lot of people on this call are living in the suburbs, um, but nature is still there, no matter how much concrete or buildings, it's still all around you. There's still an ecosystem there. Um, and it's really important to develop that relationship. And, um, you know, the, um, I don't know when it was, it was a, 20 years ago or something like that when it was in the news all about the the secret and positive um thinking and you could get abundance in your life and uh, my wife and i were talking and we just um realized you know abundance is living in a place long enough that you actually get to know it and build a reciprocal relationship with it um and then I'll just have to put in a plug, you know, for Catskill Mountain Keeper and what's been happening since we got flooded and we started this organization, which is um, taking some of these issues, you know, nurturing the soil and growing our own food in the backyard also translates to you have to protect that. Um, one of the things you all could do, if you go to Catskill Mountain Keeper's website at catskillmountainkeeper.org, there's actually a petition on there to get the big box stores to stop, stop selling plants and seeds with neonics on them. Um, um, neonicotinoids are an incredibly toxic pesticide that are people are using that are trashing the soil in places. And if you have um, soybean seed or corn seed that, and most of the seed that's sold now for farmers in New York state, it's coated with neonicotinoids or neonics. And only about 5% of that pesticide goes into the seed and into the plant. It's a systemic, what's called a systemic pesticide, which means the plant takes up that whole pesticide and then becomes poisonous to bees and um, any, uh, all sorts of things. It's an incredibly toxic pesticide. Um, but only 5% of it, the rest of it is going into the soil and into the environment. You know, one out of every three bites of food that we take um, are because of pollinators. Um, and the decline of pollinators in New York State is in direct relationship to the rise of neonicotinoid use. Um, the other thing, and I'll finish with the other thing that's really exciting to me right now, um, as a member of New York Renews, and you're going to learn all about if you go to the, the on with the next series and um, 
look at green policy, you're going to be learning about the Climate Community Investment Act and the um, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which um, passed and is law now. It's our uh, climate policy in New York State. Yeah, that's it's, our fourth, it's fourth session here. Yeah, yeah. In this series. yeah. And um, it's an opportunity, the climate, the implementation of the climate policy um, is going to be making decisions on how we transition away from fossil fuels. But one yeah. of the things that's exciting for me is there is also a soil health bill. It's not, doesn't have a number yet or whatever, but it should be released in the next couple of weeks. Soil uh, health bill. Soil health bill. This is important will incentivize better farming practices and better relationships um, with the soil, which I'm sure Daniel is going to talk about. Um, yes. Cropping and things. And uh, this, this is what we be... can do here. We can this, support this bill when you. That's right. Yeah. And as somebody that lives in a rural area in upstate New York, one of the things that we realize is that um, a lot of the politics and a lot of the decisions that are made about our lives are decided upon by people who live in the city or in suburban areas like Long Island because you have a lot more representation in the government than we do up here. So we need to work together yep. to help protect the soil, um, help the, protect the planet. And, um, and I'll stop there because I could just uh, that's so. This is so terrific. That's why we're here. That's why you're here. And that's why we're reaching out to Virginia. <laughs> and we are moving on to Daniel. But before then, we can do, as you have learned to live with the soil quality where you are, uh, we here in suburbia, we can actually in the suburban setting live with the land we're on. We can, you know, plant natives with Rewild Long Island is actually, if you go on rewildlongisland.org, there is a native plant sale going on right now and it wraps around Mother's Day. And by planting native plants, we feed the pollinators and uh, beneficial insects. And this right relationship is not, does not have to be happening outside the city. It can be happening in urban and suburban landscape. Every patch of land matters, every tree matters. And, and even, you know, you can grow herbs in your windowsill if you don't have the luxury of a, a back or front uh, live, livable space. But our goal with uh, rewilding here in suburban spaces is to shift the view from treating your back and front yard as a, another room in the house a sort of a, a, a neat and orderly place that, you know, where uh, there is no life, but rather support life. And that's uh, why I, I would love to continue with, uh, as we go to Daniel, I know Daniel has spoken. I had the pleasure of listening in yesterday um, to Daniel um, speaking with the farmer's footprint. Is that a, a, at the Mighty Networks? And, and you were speaking about how you, uh, co-create you don't coexist mm. with nature you co-create and and i'd love mm. to hear from you about how you live and and that moment when you let go of control mm. yeah absolutely absolutely um wes i i uh i i was entranced by your thought i have to be honest uh, i've been a fan of the Catskill mountain keepers uh for for a while my wife and I farm out in uh, central, Pen uh, central Pennsylvania, central Virginia. We're from the Pennsylvania, Ohio region, but we farm now in central, central Virginia on family land. And, uh, and uh, I was going to say a lot of uh, similar things, but I think you said them better. So I'm, I'm going to pivot. Uh, Hilder, I'll answer your question. Um, and, and I think what comes out of this, I hope, is abundance for everybody in, involved here in this wonderful community. Um, yeah, so just a slight background of me. I don't think I have any photos to show. Uh, we have a pretty poor internet connection where we are. So I'm talking to you via the phone and I hope my face follows. Uh, sometimes my face is a couple seconds behind my voice, but it's okay. Uh, well, anyways, my, my wife and I own uh, Timshall Wildland. We're a 400 acre farm out here in the middle of nowhere, central Virginia. Um, we, I grew up just outside of Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, we, I grew up on 30 acres. Everybody else around me had, you know, a third of an acre. And so that, that really was uh, my context. It was a, a strange reality where Taco Bell was two minutes away and Kmart and Walmart and Target were just at the other end of the road. But we had this little niche, right, this little slice of heaven uh, that to me just felt endless. 
Uh, I was from a homeschool family where we just ran around half naked outside most of our lives. And, uh, and, and the rest of my life was more or less singed with that reality. And so uh, we, we, we approach agriculture and especially regenerative agriculture with a very unique lens. When we started farming, we farmed a half an acre in the backyard of a friend's house, uh, more or less. And uh, now we exist on 400 acres and uh, we're, we're decently large scale in terms of Virginia's geographic context. And so we, we've been in both spaces and, and, and ultimately uh, probably more like Wes, uh, I, I thrive in open spaces. I like to lean against trees and take naps and write poems. And, and I just love being connected to larger, more open, less populated spaces. That's my personal context. That's, that's where I thrive. That's where my genius really, uh, it becomes more apparent. Um, and, and, and so that's a little bit of, of us, our farm, um, you know, just to touch on that for just a slight moment, uh, we raise a couple hundred head of Irish Dexter cattle. These are grass born, fed and finished uh, bees, uh, we call them. But what that means though is, uh, you know, they're, they're bred on the farm, they're born on the farm, they're raised on the farm. They eat grass all their long lives. So we raise them for many years, three to four to five years. And so we, we really focused on the ethics of the thing in the sense that we want them to experience life to the fullest sense. We're not interested in grain finishing, you know, your standard Angus or Hereford cattle in 18 months, turning the system over and receiving a profit. We're interested in that relationship aspect, uh, which means we need more time with them. Just like Wes was saying, actually spending time in a place, becoming native to that place, developing a relationship with that place is very important, right? But time is that indicator, time is that need. I was reading a book recently, uh, Dr. Edith Eger, or Eger. Uh, she's a Hungarian woman, survivor of the Holocaust. She's still living today. She wrote a book. Um, it's called The Choice by Dr. Edith Eger, or Eger, uh, survivor of Auschwitz, which is just an amazing story. But in the book, she says, love is a four-letter word, time, T-I-M-E. Love requires time, and it's the same thing when you're developing a relationship to your place, whether or not it's an eighth of an acre in the backyard or 800 acres in rural central Virginia or upstate New York, right? We're talking about time in place. That really is what regenerative agriculture is about. On top of the cattle, uh, we have about 150 head of cattle, so at any point in, in time, our farm will see, you know, 250 plus animals. Uh, we also raise pigs and sheep, chickens. Uh, we, you know, dabbled in turkeys and ducks, and then we have a pretty sizable uh, uh, market garden, if you will, uh, that feeds our family more or less year-round. Uh, that's my wife, myself, our three kids, and my uh, my mom and dad who live on the property. And so we, we dabble in some perennial and annual veggie and fruit agriculture, all the way through pretty large-scale animal-based agriculture, and uh, we're, we're very happy there. But what, what I really want to talk about uh, is regenerative agriculture. I think Wes's uh, summary, uh, summary of, of regeneration and relationship to place, what he said is brilliant. And I'll try not to repeat exactly what he said, but I, I just was sitting here agreeing with him the entire time. So I'll do my best. Um, but, but to me, the word regeneration, it implies a balance, right? A cycle. Birth, growth, life, death, rebirth, right? That rebirth portion where we take life that passes through the system, we'll be talking about this more compost, but that rebirth portion is, is the thing itself. That's where the abundance occurs. We, you know, on, in our educational side of our lives, we, we always say life nurtures death and death in that way also nurtures life, but life is death. And so life nurtures life. And that is a beautiful reality where you relate this process, this cycle, this balance back to the regenerative system. And in that way we have regenerative agriculture. Yes. Uh, I don't know the, the context of everybody on, on, in, in this community on this call, um, but perhaps some of us here are familiar with regenerative agriculture, uh, but I, I do want to open the space to those who maybe the idea of agriculture leading, right, a climate-based process-led and systems paradigm that regenerates communities, and I mean that from a natural sense, and I mean that from a you sense, right, think about, look outside of your window, look at the neighbors, that's also the community that I'm talking about. This idea seems paradoxical, that agriculture can be regenerative, that agriculture can be one of the solutions in a very dangerous and climate changing world. Yes, and, and, said, and I, I wanted to uh, pause there because you just um, 
that's something that's relevant to for us here to understand the, the damage that the industrial, the commercial, large scale um, agriculture monoculture uh, is is doing to to the climate, to our uh, livelihoods, and the you know the importance of supporting small scale regenerative farmers that's uh, supporting farmers that are choosing polycultures and 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 cover crops and and you know we would i'm interested in how to support you how to support the uh, you you are part of the savory network mm. right and the um right. jesse jesse is working on the regenerative food network because um, I think it's important for us to feel connected to the food that we eat. Our consumption is driving climate change, climate crisis, right? Right. Would, yeah, it, it's it's a, a re real interesting, real interesting. I mean, there's not really a question there, but but it is really a question: Can your food choices cure the climate crisis? Right. I mean, I, don't, I think there's many cures. If, if there's a climate in jeopardy, right, it's all of humanity needs to come together as a whole and tackle many different problems. But but they start in your backyard, or you could also say they start at the dining room table, right? In many ways, these are the same conversations. Um, I, I think if you're looking at it from a perception or a language perspective, I think it's a question that we all need to ask ourselves. And there's a tree outside of my house, and I assume there's a tree relatively close to your house. And so in this way, we do have a shared geographic context. But it, the, this question is, is a tree's leaves, right, in autumn, a, nuis a nuisance or a nourishment, mm -hmm. right? I'll ask that question again. Is autumn a nuisance or a nourishment, right? Your answer to this question is your answer to the climate crisis in, in many ways. In addition to that, what foods are you nourishing your bodies with? Right, just like Wes was talking about earlier, the foods that we cultivate all around us right, are not only part of our climate, not only part of our geography, but a part of ourselves. Right? And that is a deep, deep relationship that we're just beginning to understand. It, it's interesting talking about language as a, as a quick aside. Uh, the Latin root of cultivation is cultivo, and it means to till, to toil, or uh, to, uh, to, uh, to flip over, if you will. It's what we understand tillage from. The Latin root of cultivation is really tillage. And, and that's not always a negative thing, but we're beginning to understand the science of tillage-based agriculture to be a, a really a, a negative aspect of the climate crisis and, and the general movement to solve that crisis. But it's really interesting diving into the language. If you go past Latin and you go all the way to the Greek, the Koine Greek, the, the, the cognate, the source of, of the Latin word cultivo, it's not cultivo, it actually sounds entirely different, it's, it's palo. And it doesn't mean to till, to toil, it means to be or to become, hmm. right? So the idea, the fundamental linguistic or uh, idea of cultivation is not to destroy, it's not to flip over, it's not to toil, but to become, right? It's an invitation for relationship. That Thank is you. regenerative agriculture. And, and it's written our language. We just and have I, to dive pretty deep for it. And, and I really want to direct everyone here to your book that was recently released, Wild Like Flowers. I've been listening on Audible as I, I, I just recently uh, got to know you. And it's, it's really a, a moving meditation. And, and it's really in itself, uh, uh, it feels a regenerative read. So if anybody's looking for it, we will be we will be following up with a resource page with links to your work and how to support you. And um, I want to uh, you just touched upon a really sensitive subject. You mentioned the leaves and uh, something mm. that I would appreciate uh, our community to understand is that nature had a plan and the plan uh, we have broken the carbon cycle we have we have to repair the carbon cycle <laughs> by that i mean we can't be plastic bagging leaves for landfill anymore there has to be this understanding <laughs> at an elementary school level really there needs to be this eco literacy that we understand that that's not okay you can't just take the nourishment that landed at the roots of the tree and bag it and trash it that's, that's a broken carbon cycle. That's really um, um, 
so fundamental to living right is, uh, and here in town of North Hampstead, there is a way to responsibly rid of organic waste. And that means it's um, um, removed from your property in paper bags or in uh, suitable containers, you can put it out curbside but it's still gonna end up in a truck and may even end up out of state while spewing, spewing carbon, you know, greenhouse gas emissions. So that's like a real tender point you touched upon for me because I would, I would like to, as, as a community to come together and really care for where the leaves land and why and understand mm. that cycle and repair that cycle. And that's where, you know, the conversation quite naturally goes to composting. Leaves are wonderful, the carbon we need for, uh, for a healthy compost. And, and, and people think uh, it's a big deal to compost. It's really simple. And that's as a community here at Transition Town, we're offering that. We have a community compost at the Science Museum of Long Island where uh, 10 families have turned over. I think it, last time we looked, we, we weighed just to show the, the amount of food waste we're turning away from the landfill and it's it's like uh, 2,000 pounds already wow. in just a few months and and that'll bring us to Marisa we could we could talk for for such a uh, uh, I mean we could host each one of you for an hour each but I want to move the conversation so we can start the conversation with the community and the way we're going to do this is we will um, open up we're we're actually uh, intentionally have closed the chat for um to sort of um uh, adopt this culture of presentation in person so it's not um uh, the the chat will be opened after marissa speaks and we will then have a more interactive part where you can write your questions in the chat and you can also write them now if you have thoughts comments or all the participants who are still here with us um, and 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 to participate with your thoughts question comments uh, write to margaret margaret galbraith and you can start doing that already but then we open up the chat after marissa thank you so much daniel thank you okay i think i'm on now right Yes. <laughs> well, welcome. Um, thank you for welcoming me. And I'm just really honored to be here with both of these speakers and, and yourself and everyone here in the audience. And uh, I would just like to say that while you all were very beautiful in your two, two um, uh, presentations, uh, my presentation is going to be more of like, you all are like kind of really over there and like maybe LMNOP land, like you, you've gotten a lot of great ideas and you've been living, living the life. But for many of us, especially in New York City and in Long Island, we're still at A, <laughs> maybe we're at B, maybe we're at C. And so I wanted to pose the question to have everyone write into chat how many people actually are composting? And it could be that you're just recycling your own leaves. Or it could be that you're dropping off at the science center. It could be that you're working with your school's kids. Um, is there any way, shape or form that you're part of that? Because- oh, Yeah, we could, we could actually, I could open up the chat now or you could raise your a virtual hand mm -hmm. you know there's a way to raise an electronic hand so if anybody's composting already you could raise your hand yeah i'm curious yeah well and we could do it kind of at the end if you wanted to go through this but don't be I shy any little way that you are already getting started is farther along than many of the people that have forgotten about the ways of nature or are living in a life like in new york city where we're all about the next second. We're really not thinking about long-term. We're really not thinking about um, having relationships with our, our soil. We're just like trying to get to the next red light. I don't know why, but that's really what it is. That road rage is just about trying to make sure we get through that yellow light. And so taking a pause um, and recognizing that we all eat and while everybody could say they have a zero waste lifestyle, generally there's gonna be something left over at the end of the day. And so we just wanna just try to kind of encourage each and every person, wherever you are, 
that composting is the most basic thing that each and every one of us can do to affect the climate mitigation that we seek. So right. everybody on the call, I think, is actually looking for the answer. They're all trying to find the way. They're trying to find the answer about, about things. But don't look outside yourself because we can all be part of that solution. And that's really what our organization is about. So I have a few slides to talk a little bit about Earth Matter, um, about what we do on Governor's Island in New York City. And the goal is really about wherever we are to take ourselves to the next step. So our organization is all about the microbes. It's all about working with each other. That's a nematode swimming down there. That's a great sign that there's life in the soil. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for wherever your soil is to make it a little bit better. And we feel the solution is just through us by recognizing that. Um, everything in our world is about relationship with one another and it's just to highlight that and to energize that if you think there's some kind of a waste out there whether it's chicken poop or your old sandwich it's going to be food for somebody else all right we can go to the next slide please and our goal on governor's island is 172 acre island and we are um thinking that it's a great opportunity because on the island we are working with our partners who are working with us to say we can be this model of saying we don't want any plastic plastic bags were banned way before we had the bag ban uh, we don't have any uh, petroleum based service where I wish every single restaurant had China that they washed but they don't so at least let's use plant-based plastics and we have flock of chicken, we have a couple of goats, and these are kind of unique in New York City to have a flock of 80 chickens uh, for people to come, but it's a way for us to have people connect. And after they are done with the food scraps, we work with people, we have uh, apprentice programs, we have visitors, and they can all come and help us. And then through our farming program, which is a very small demonstration garden, uh, we grow some crops such as herbs that are sold by the vendors, microgreens, um, so that visitors can then come and buy it and, and around and around we go. So uh, we have four projects on the island. Uh, one is called the Zero Waste Island, where we are working with all of the vendors and the training program. Um, to uh, of the, the people that are on the island. We have the Compost Learning Center. We invite groups such as in the lower left hand schools to come and work with us. And we have lots of different tours of people that come and look at our um, different types of composting. We have backyard devices, we have uh, mid-scale devices and we have uh, all kinds of games up on the top. It talks about what's in your compost. Is it a carbon source? Is it a more highly nitrogen source? And uh, we really just love to interact with just about anybody that comes. We've had bike tours, we've had uh, senior centers. We have all kinds of different ways that people feel like can connect, whether it's through a heritage farm. Um, so we could come visit you now? Yeah, well, in May, the island okay. starts opening and we have uh, Saturdays and Sundays where people can just drop in anytime. Mm -hmm. Next slide um, talks about our relationship with the city. We have the, the New York City Department of Sanitation. They um, over here, it says there's some places that are still bag leaves to a landfill. Honestly, I took a photo at the East River Park where I live in the Lower East Side. And I was concerned that in our New York City Parks Department that's not mandating compost at parks, they are going to the landfill. They're, they were in black bags and they say it's a, it's a capacity issue that there's no funding for the staff to take that on. And meanwhile, meanwhile, we're losing, I think, 23 billion tons of topsoil a year. Yeah. And what are we doing <laughs> for that park? 
We're building, we're using millions of our taxpayer dollars to build resiliency walls. Yeah. <laughs> and we have the solution right there with the leaves that are falling on the ground. And um, are, are, then are we gonna import soil? I mean, it's, it's just uh, like you were saying, Hilder, it's a little bit of a broken system, but we really have to stay positive. So yeah. on Governor's Island in the back corner, you'll see that there's the leaves from the island that are brought to us and those black, bins and the green bins are all the people in the in the city who wouldn't take no when the pandemic hit and our composting budget went out the window and the city had this zero by 30 and then it was a zero by 50 waste plan and that budget got just eradicated and uh, a lot of people thousands of people i would say over 10,000 people uh, wrote to the city council and they restored the drop offs uh, for people to go to farmers markets. And so that's a photo uh, where we have participation from over 10,000 people in five farmers markets that come to Earth Matter once a week. That's amazing. Yes, it's so amazing. I love that. Yeah. And so we have our drop off and there's our city councilwoman, Margaret Chin, along with our island staff. The Sarah is in tan and uh, we collect compost. You can come to Bowling Green and drop off your food scraps every Tuesday morning. It's amazing. Um, over there to the in the bottom shows a team before the pandemic we would have groups come to help us with um, composting this material that came into the island in in the back of that photo shows a system called the Gore-Tex system that we use um, to help us with um, having a breathable cover that uh, allows us to make the compost uh, throughput a little faster um, mm -hmm. it does take uh, about 16 months before we will sift it. And um, you'll see in that corner in the bottom left, some of our windrows, it's an aerated static pile. We have like Beautiful. little, little pumps of, that pump air in there instead of using a lot of uh, machinery to turn it regularly to aerate because those microbes need that. Yes, uh, and we, we should be doing this here because a land is eroding. Long Island is, is, is really, um, you know, eroding as we speak. And um, in order to bioremediate, <laughs> we mm -hmm. could be making, this is earth. You, yeah. could, you, could, you, you use this to um, replenish and um, you use it as a soil amendment in the parks, right? You, you can use it on the farms too. It, 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 all of those um, liquid fertilizers are going to be going into your water table. And I personally have three relatives in Long Island that died from cancer. And I'm not so unsure that it wasn't because the water table was filled with a lot of chemicals, pharmaceuticals, and runoff. Yeah, we have many. Anyway, sup we have super fun sites here that <sighs> need uh, bioremediation and I, I like how simple it is you see here piles of of you know healthy soil that yeah you created that, from food waste food waste and yard waste um and yeah. that's it's a very simple system those green uh, pumps cost about fifty dollars um and up on uh so anyway our goal for I, the island is to have everybody recognize that what they're uh, doing when they're on the island is exportable. So um, the picture of the vendor there who was showing how there's a policy about having only serviceware that's made from corn or um, sugar cane, or um, they even make it out of thistle now, forks and, and plates. We don't want any of that PFAS, which is um, what is um, a chemical that has been in like Teflon pans and think about a love uh, canal, but uh, they, they're continuing to develop just like the electric car where there's a will, there's a way technology is coming along. And the more we support organic, the more we support methods that are going to be regenerative, the, the more demand there is, the easier it's going to be, but we have to make that decision. So over there, you'll see Eugene and all of that stuff. It looks like a bunch of garbage, but that's actually all that serviceware is um, going to break down in our pile within two to three weeks. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's because we have a hot system because we have a, a recipe 
that is going to make sure that those pathogens are, are, are killed because the temperatures are about 160 degrees for about 15 days or so, um, they're going to melt. They might not melt as easily in a backyard system, but in Long Island, it is very easy for you to set up New York State Department of Environmental Conservation sites um, to be able to work with your each and every municipality to, to process your own stuff. Anyway, Amazing. in the middle, yes, you can do it. In the middle photograph on the bottom shows how we are working with youth. And in the back of him is a little compost system um, that's an in vessel. It's like a big Cousinart. You know, you, you have an auger in there, and that school on uh, the island um, has a cafeteria collection program, and the students run that um, earth tub to make soil for their front yard garden. And over there on the bottom, it's our team. It's our team of people because as much as we want to try, not everybody gets it right. And contamination levels have, we can't put stuff that is not organic. And so while we want to increase the laws that are going to ban a lot of materials that are not organic, for now, we just have to accept that we're not all going to get it perfect. And our, our rates are going down as our education goes up. Um, so we're very optimistic. Mm -hmm. The next slide just shows how uh, we are applying compost on a regular basis. Uh, we do um, kind of an intensive kind of growing because we only have a quarter acre. But um, in the picture on the right, it shows that we grow our food for the Catholic worker, which is a soup kitchen. And, um, you know, with the pandemic and th things are not rosy for many people and they started serving from 200 to 300 meals up from 50 meals every day when the pandemic hit. So you know what they wanted? They wanted herbs and flowers. They, they wanted to be able to serve people herbal tea along with their sandwiches. And um, so, you know, we were just so excited about what they felt that people needed to heal. And so we just gave it to them. <laughs> people needed to heal, earth needs to heal. We yeah. heal together. Yep. And so in that picture down below, we show the um, weeds. We really are all about um, recycling all everything that comes out of the farm. And the next, oh, you, yeah, yeah, over there, that's uh, some of our apprentices that are making sure that uh, we heat up those weed seeds because mm -hmm. they otherwise would sprout. But they, it, you know, if you do a nice hot pile, a batch of compost, you will eradicate the weed seeds. That's amazing. And, yeah. Um, and over here is just a picture of our lavender field. It's over 500 plants and we gave them to a lot of the medical workers and just about anybody. We gave them to people that were working at Rite Aid. So um, during the pandemic, um, people were able to come out on a limited basis last year and experience this field in May or June and sit under the tree. And the whole idea is that we all need to be immersed in beauty and nature and of course, these shrubs, these woody perennials are a great source of carbon for our compost. So we have to make sure that um, we just teach everyone that, like you said, your browns are not going into the landfill. You need those resources. We all need them. Yeah. Yeah. This is beautiful work you've been doing there. And I would so like to um, and invite you know this type of activity here to Long Island we have such beautiful grounds to protect here and and restore yeah well yeah you can do it you're you're already doing it by having these talks and having these gatherings and show how many people are showing up for these talks there's a great interest and yes. everybody can help their neighbors and their families get on board. This is a picture, I'll just try to wrap it up. Um, Catherine Garcia running for mayor. She quit the team of sanitation when the mayor just wouldn't support these kinds of positive composting um, efforts. And uh, uh, there's also city council people in there. There's community composters that stepped up to the plate when the composting was suspended in New York City. But anyway, it's just a picture showing that there's many different people that can work together to make this happen. Yes, and, and Marissa, you'd be proud to hear that when, um, when they um, stopped in the city, we started here. 
in this yes. in this small scale community compost. The idea with our community compost is to invite um, community to come and learn how easy it is. You know, because really we don't need to have a specific site. If if you have the space and luxury, you can do it in your. Um, livable space and or you could uh, if you're in an apartment bokashi is a method bokashi is a fermentation method you can use there's so many different ways to do this and i'd love to invite community now to come and and join uh, with their questions and comments and thoughts and and actually i would like to invite first uh, wes and daniel and marissa to have a conversation <laughs> I feel so blessed, so honored to be here with you, Earthmakers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's really something that I worry about. I've seen, you know, alarming reports that we have uh, uh, just a, a limited number of harvests left. You may have seen those reports. I don't know if it was sensational, but the UN suggested 60 harvests left because um, we're eroding the topsoil faster than we're replenishing. And with the, with the soil, soil erosion, there is this, uh, there is a, I think people aren't uh, understanding that the topsoil is the layer we need to, to harvest sunlight. <laughs> and without topsoil, without plant life, we are not much. Um, and, and what's amazing is soil is actually only made up of about five to eight percent of that layer that humus because 85 to 90 to 95 percent is mineral it, it's like the the, the bedrock that's like a, of a mineralization if there's only five percent of humus that's doing all that heavy lifting and so if we allow it to erode then all we're left with is is dead soil and there's many civilizations that have died because that that erosion had happened in the past so now we have another moment to um not have that history repeat itself yes exactly i know daniel has a thought or two about rock and soil i heard uh, <laughs> i've heard him speak on that <laughs> Oh, yeah. No, it, 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 it's more of an indigenous perspective uh, on the understanding between dirt and soil, right? Uh, I, I'm known to say, uh, what is it? Rocks are just, uh, or I'm sorry, soil, soil is living, that's true, but, but, but dirt is just rocks that didn't want to be dirt or rocks anymore. And uh, <laughs> soil is dirt, so old rocks that just invited the uh, soil food web to a party and the festivities began. So we're pushing towards soil, right? But we need to go through dirt forest, right? We have to turn rocks to dirt, dirt to soil. And, and composting is, is a marvelous way to expedite that or expedite that process pretty quickly, pretty yes. quickly. And, and all this talk about reducing fossil fuel emissions, we have our natural ally right there ready to you know, sequester carbon. I, I took out this article from the Wall Street uh, Journal where they said oil giants are preparing to put carbon back in the ground. Did you hear about that? I bet, Wes. Did you hear about that? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a lot of false solutions <laughs> out there. Uh, it's mm. it's pretty crazy. Um, I, you know, the, even just talking about the difference between rock or dirt, I the first thing that popped into my head is is just creating these barriers between natural um, systems. It, it, they, they don't really exist. Um, I mean, very few, you know, not many people talk about the fact that when a tree transpirates, um, it releases carbonic acid out of its roots and that travels in streams out to the ocean. That's what the oceanic creatures make their shells out of. That gets deposited on the bottom of the, bottom of the ocean. And then um, that, you know, that's the best farming soils in New York state, which was used to be an inland sea. Um, it's a relationship between something that's a living becomes rock and then that goes back and nurtures um, new living systems. And that's, that's the thing that, you know, the, the earth has taken millions of years and is taking an excess amount of carbon out of our atmosphere and storing it. And then we've turned around and, well, let's just dig it all back up and burn it. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of work. insane. I mean, it totally throws the system <laughs> off. And that's what we're facing with what we're facing here. And there's so many ways. Um, it's really exciting to see that that composting happen, um, you know, in a in yeah. an urban area and a rural, you know, suburban area, because um, I mean, 
lawns really just don't make sense, especially a lawn that you're not nurturing the grass. If it was grass you were in love with, it wouldn't, you wouldn't be spraying pesticides on it. Um, you would be nurturing it and, and then harvesting it and, yes. and using it um, to enhance where you live. I wanted to address a question that someone put in very early, which was, um, how do you know the best way to take care of the soil in the area? This is all super, super impressive. Well, but the, how do you know? And I just want to say, you don't have to, you can figure it out. Um, having that compost pile in your backyard, if you do it wrong and you don't mix it, you know, Marissa has the system down. They have a whole system to bring the temperatures up and it'll destroy the seeds and, you know, keep out the, but if you don't do it right, it will still compost. It'll just take longer. Um, so, yeah. I, you know, and if it starts to smell and you're worried about your neighbor complaining about it, that's probably time you need to turn it. <laughs> and, and add some browns. It, again, it's like anything you want to do, even like a recipe, like you might not have the right salt, or you might have not enough leavening, but just keep at it and do the recipe over and over again. And as far as breaking down or failing, the microbes are amazing. Like there could be anaerobic. Don't you think I made, made a stinky compost? We've all done it. And they actually can switch up those anaerobic microbes. Once you give them what they need, many of them will just turn right on to the right side if you give them the right ingredients or you just, just keep at it. And when in doubt, add your carbon sources. So like we were talking about your leaves, I mean, that's not a question about, in, uh, actually, I'm sorry, Daniel, but it is not a question as to a nuisance. You could just say that you might not have time to, to, to do your leaves, but you know, I, 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 real, I cannot imagine anybody in this chat not helping to help us go out with a message that yes. leaves are the answer. <laughs> yes, and, and leave the leaves. <laughs> Let them be. But, but what's, what's interesting is, uh, you know, here we're a waterfront community. And so it's always been uh, very, um, like the, the sense of disconnect to use uh, chemical fertilizers or these chemically addicted lawns, the culture that is here with the land is, is it's, it's really um, something that we need to stop, I think, overnight. Like, you know, smoking was kind of a thing that then was just banned in public, <laughs> you know? And I, I think there are certain things that should just be banned, like bagging of leaves, you know, um, understanding the ecological value. When we cut down a tree, we are gonna restore that uh, with honor. Uh, you know, here often people cut trees uh, because, um, they're not uh, they're considered unsafe but then restore honor that being by restoring that life with the same ecological value if you care about you know the air purification the drainage the i'm i'm putting out uh, i can put out like 20 good scientific reasons that you should replace a one mature oak with at least a dozen because it takes we don't have 60 years to wait for a tree to grow up and, and there's a disconnect in our policy here that I hope to, you know, I hope our electeds are still uh, l listening. We're going to be sharing with our electeds and we want to have this really sincere conversation because we, the, the numbers now we're looking at 10 years to reverse climate change or mitigate. Um, and, and it can be done everywhere, urban, suburban, farm life, um, you know, wherever we are on the planet, we have responsibility that's that's what I feel strongly about and I think a good way for anyone who wants to build soil here in our um, on uh, in our town today uh, planting deep rooted natives polycultures to take that lawn and mulch it and contact the rewild Long Island and there's a plant sale going on I think Rashu is here and he can uh, share with us in the chat the the flyer for the spring uh, native plant sale. Native plants are great. They want to be here. They, 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 they are not even going to insist on being watered and, and tended to too much. I, it's always an experiment for me to when, when my garden wakes up uh, and to see who, who wants to be there this spring. 
it's not that the gardening becomes it's actually a, a very lazy way to garden but it's a natural way to be and the aesthetics have to change i think the the what's beautiful the view of what's beautiful my neighbors are very um, um they tolerate my winter suit that's brown and um stalks and and it doesn't look uh, pretty if you want it to be ornamental and green all year round but i grew up in iceland where winter is winter and and spring is spring and and you can't force nature in iceland you just can't you just you cannot insist on any other season than the season you're living and i think that's something that i would love for our community um to care for and um, and Rashu is gonna he's he shared with us here the um, website Rewild Long Island uh, slash events and if if anybody wants to uh, contribute with thoughts or comments or questions we welcome your um, and I, I actually want to open up. Um, the, I see there's not a lot of questions in written form. I could address the, I mean, someone put in there that they know somebody who does research on atrazine, which is a, a, a lawn chemical. Um, and again, this is, you know, this is, people are trying to control the weeds in their, in their lawn um, or the quote unquote pests. Um, and it's forgetting that a, a lawn or a field is, it, it is an entire ecosystem. And by trying to control it, by keeping certain parts of it out, it doesn't actually work. Um, you know, you use herbicides or weed control chemicals um, that takes out the clover. You know, the uh, clover is a legume that adds nitrogen to the soil naturally. So you don't need to add fertilizer. So you take those weed, those quote unquote weeds out and you remove that, then you need to add fertilizer of some sort. Um, when, by adding fertilizer, you basically, you know, you create a grass or a plant or in our farms, our food products are plants that, um, you know, it, it's basically like you or I trying to live on slim fast or some diet drink, you know, yes, it will keep you alive, but you're not gonna really be healthy. Um, and, and when you're not a healthy plant, that's when um, insects are attracted and they dive bomb the, the plant that's not healthy. So it just, it throws off this really complex, beautiful um, creation that we have um, and relationship between the soil and plants um, that the use of chemicals just really doesn't make any sense on any level. Uh, and we also, uh, Marissa mentioned the uh, um, pesticides or the chemicals in Long Island water. Temic is still found in Long Island water sources. Temic was another systemic pesticide that's outlawed now. And it was, a, it, made it into the whole potato plant and made the potato plant poisonous to anything that ate it. Um, what yeah. happens when we eat plants that are grown in, with that? I mean, there, our digestive systems, it's not like, it's not a machine. It's another ecosystem within our bodies that are taking food and breaking it down and, and processing it just the same way the compost pile works. So by adding chemicals, it throws off our own bodies. Yes, and I see a question from Karenna um, about how to support the soil health bill. What can we do today to support uh, the soil health bill? So uh, Donald Lepardo, who is the um, chair of the Ag Committee in um, the Assembly, and then Michelle Hinchy is the chair of the Ag Committee in the Senate, and they will be introducing a bill shortly. There's some drafts. Um, it's been going out to different stakeholder groups, farming organizations, soil and water conservation district. People are responding to a draft bill and that hopefully will be introduced um, shortly. So there will be a big push this legislative session, which ends in June, um, to get a soil health bill. And it will create a fund um, that will be used for, um, in, uh, that can go to farmers for programs and education. 
both like soil and water um, and the entities that are already out there that can do education, but then also opportunities for peer to peer. Um, you know, one thing that happens in the agricultural world is if one farmer is successful at something, that much a much better teacher than the, necessarily the, the specialist. But if farmers see other farmers succeeding with practices, um, so there's there's a whole. It's a pretty comprehensive bill, but it it will reduce the number the amount of tillage. It will encourage cover cropping and um, and uh, disincentivize the use of chemicals. Um, it's not you know it's not a straight up organic bill, but um, it will get farmers much farther along in terms of treating the land in a reciprocal manner than um, at least what happens now. So, um, and it, it, over the long haul, um, it also, another political thing that it does is it actually takes out some of the things that are happening in the um, Agriculture Advisory Committee to the Climate Action Council. They're trying to come up with this big plan for what agriculture looks like. So by actually, um, incentivizing better farming practices right off the bat. Um, it will push um, farmers into better practices so the Climate Action Council hasn't, doesn't have to spend their time figuring that they can work on more controversial um, issues like biofuels and things like that that, that farmers are using. Um, so keep your eyes out for it and you can go, always go to the Mount Keeper website. Uh, we will be putting out an action alert at, at some point. So you could sign up for our action alerts to, yes. get that, um, to get support for that bill. And I want to mention, we're going to send out the resources, uh, um, materials uh, to support and including in the regenerative food network and other things. Um, and oh. and I, I want to acknowledge actually that Wes and, and Daniel joined us on at very short notice. We found out just Tuesday that um, Jesse wasn't joining, so um, I just want to thank you for being with us here tonight. And Marissa, sorry, did I? I just wanted to answer the couple of questions in the chat about the composting. One was about the rodents and the raccoon issue. And it, it definitely, we're just not trying to suggest everything is easy. And that, you know, if you have rodents that, it, that it's not a bad thing. Um, there are some kinds of composters that are in vessel like tumblers that are deterrent to things like raccoons, even though raccoons are very smart. And then the second one about, can I just dig a hole? That is definitely a type of compost Oftentimes, though, the critters are really smart. Like, you know, if you have bears in your area, upstate or something, you might not want to do that. I don't know how many bears there are in um, Long Island, but um, it, I would dig a really deep hole and, um, and cover it with a lot of soil. And you're not maybe necessarily trying to harvest that compost. You're just doing waste reduction by doing that, which is fantastic as well. And then uh, I, I do certainly hope that there will be more and more people in Long Island and more facilities in Long Island that are processing the food waste so that not everyone feels they actually have to have the land. A lot of people in Long Island live in apartment buildings as well as uh, having their own homes. So well, there's no one, one size fits all. Yeah, and we don't have bear, but we recently had coyotes. Um, but uh, I, we advocate for the uh, three-pin system where you can actually uh, chicken wire, you can uh, close it in that way that um, you can keep it. I have a, a, I've been composting for probably 10 years and never seen a raccoon or a rodent in my... So the engineering part, we can help with at the Science Museum of Long Island. We're there every Saturday morning you can come and see a, a simple construction that, that'll take you a long way. The town of North Hampstead offers composting uh, workshops that uh, sustainability workshops, they do show the plastic um, rotational, uh, but that's sort of just for gathering the scraps because you need a, a better system to take it the next to the next level and we teach seminars so um, I, I believe Claire is going to drop in the chat uh, some dates that we will be offering to community to learn about composting and um, Rewild Long Island also helps with Bokasi composting that's a fermented uh, type of that you can do indoors so there are many many different alternatives uh, that we can actually 
be uh, turning towards. And this weekend on Saturday, I just want to mention if anybody wants to plant the tree, we'll be at the Science Museum of Long Island. We'll share that in resources. And we're planting uh, native trees to shade out Phragmitis. So we are planting uh, willows and native um, trees uh, uh, by the Leeds Pond with in an uh, attempt to uh, uh, naturally shade out some invasives. And who's uh, at the Science Museum is sharing in the chat that um, there's a smli.org slash family workshops, family compost workshops coming up. So please uh, go there if you feel overwhelmed by, you know, how to begin. There's a good way to begin. I just wanted to say one thing too about compost. Um, as a kid, uh, my parents always had a compost pile in the yard. It can occupy a kid for a long time. There was a lot of things crawling in and around there to poke at and watch. Um, so don't keep one, one, one thing to add here is just don't keep your keep the raccoons out of your compost, but you don't necessarily have to keep the kids out. No, never, especially when you're working with worms. Mm -hmm. Kids love worms. And and uh, Claire Travis, I, I really want to uh, she's here. And she is managing the community compost uh, beautifully. She actually picks up coffee chaffs that smell really good. So everyone who comes to our compost is really uh, impressed that it, it actually smells pleasant. We never reach a, a, a bad odor there because we, we like to mix in some you know, nice uh, smelling uh, coffee chaffs. Does anybody want to, uh, is, are there any questions, thoughts, comments? We're coming up, uh, uh, we have five minutes left. I just wanna thank community for being here and we will be sharing resources and, and gathering again on plastic. We are going to um, try to reduce the use of single use plastics. So in two weeks we meet again and we will be here with uh, leaders from the Beyond Plastic Movement. And Claire is sharing in the, in the chat that, um, yes, that's the, that's the brown we used, the, the coffee chat. Am I saying it right? Is, the, is, it, is there another pronunciation? <laughs> So our wonderful panelists, do you have uh, final thoughts, uh, inspiration, motivation for our community? I would say, you know, as a society, we have a lot of work to do to transition away from fossil fuels and um, how we are working in the carbon cycle and, and, and fitting into that system. The climate is a huge threat that's going to affect us all. And really what we're talking about, a small change about creating a compost pile in your backyard and going out and finding a local farmer if you're anywhere near a farm or making sure you're buying organic, all those changes not just um, get us closer there, but also um, enable you to become somebody that knows how to make transition in your life because we all are going to have to do it. Um, people keep talking about replacing energy sources with renewable energy. We can't just replace all the energy sources. We need to start living differently as a society. We can't just go out and buy as many plastic items as we, can, as we want. We can't be producing food on, with industrial agriculture. And I could just, I could spend 20 minutes going down through the list of things that we need to change. But so like every little thing you do now will enable you and your family to be much better and much more adaptable for making those changes. Yes, yeah. and, and there was one question about the lawns. I saw, I just caught this one. Out, outside of changing local laws and policies, what strategies are being taken to reduce the stigma about uh, not having a traditional lawn? Some townships and villages will still fine if you don't maintain a neat lawn. So that's where we're at here, and that's what we need to change. And that's why we're gathering in community and discussing this, because... Um, it, the time is now. 
Mm -hmm. and and we have to uh, take action and we gather as a community. So transition town Port Washington is not a community specific to, it just originated in Port Washington. We welcome everyone in Port Washington and around Port Washington to come and join. And, and the way to change the view is, is really um, to, to, to gather in community and start uh, doing better by in this relationship and it's interesting a friend of mine said good luck tonight Hilter and I said thank you and she said well you don't need luck you've got science <laughs> so uh, I, yeah. I, I like that I was like yeah let's just uh, stick with the it's actually soil science will save the world that's how I, I'll, I'll yeah I'd like to end by um, answering someone asked well what can a small home gardener do and um, I would say that I, I have my own garden outside of my, uh, where I live. And I just make sure I make my own mulch. Yeah. I have my own pruning shears. And if I want to, at the end of the, uh, I do it now in the spring because I like the winter color of the stalks. But if I'm taking my plants down as the new plants are coming up in the spring or in the annuals at the fall, and if you have a nice, solid kind of a, of a plant that has produced that kind of a, a stem or you're doing some pruning of your own, just chop it up, size of your finger or smaller, and then add that as a mulch around your trees or, 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 or in between your rows of your own home garden. Get creative. You, can, you, you could find some ways if you, you think about it. When you're looking at what you have and you think of it as waste, you could just say, what can I do with that organic matter that could make it into a new life or to give it life to some other organisms. Yeah. Mm. And, and um, mm. I like that. Daniel. Yeah. Yeah, I would, uh, I, I would echo uh, what Wes was saying. Uh, you know, I think our culture, we live off of a story of separation. Right. We, we see our lives and we see a natural life. And if we go into the rural setting, we go there to vacation or, you know, whatever it is, it's, it's enjoyment. And that's the way it should be right in rural settings. And most all of life is enjoyable. I'm not saying take that out. But what we, we, what we have to do is transition right to a to a story of community, right, of reciprocity, of understanding that the natural world is our world. Right. Carbon right now is seen as the bad guy. I think that's a lot of what these narratives claim. And if, if that's how you're attacking this conversation, that's how I attacked it many years ago. But you are carbon, right? A tree is carbon. <laughs> carbon is all around us, right? Carbon is not the bad guy. It's how we handle it, how we actually have this relationship with the thing, right? To transform this negative thing that's causing cl climate change to soil food, right? Cl carbon sequestration is the understanding that plants are sequestering carbon via photosynthesis to feed via the root nodules, basically the root systems, via the soil food web and all this other science, the, the, the soil and, and, and the rebirth of new plants, new life, right, to feed humans, to feed wildlife, to feed bumblebees, to feed uh, cows. And so the idea is looking at it from a different perspective. That, that transition is just imperative, but it's a transition to community and, and relationship. So that this has been fun. Thank you guys. Well, thank you so much for, for being here with us and giving us a view into your world that's a shared world with us. Mm -hmm. We're all here together in this global ecosystem, <laughs> part of each other's life. Um, and I, and I, I want to just acknowledge Georgiana in the chat and Delano uh, Irvin, I see Georgiana, Dorian, Riley. I, we're here to, mm -hmm. to change the view. I think it's 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 nice when somebody comes and tries to rake your leaves when you're trying to let them be. <laughs> we have to put a, a sign to leave my leaves. But we, we can we it starts with education out here. Everyone I meet is well intentioned. And I want to conclude with that. A, a lot of um, the disconnect is it's been it, since the industrial age, the way we live, just the fact that you know this article is is suggesting that um, oil giants are going to use geoengineering to take the pollution and pump it into the uh, ocean floor <laughs> in a similar way, like 
fracking disturbing you know the sediment so these type of solutions are false solutions and we need to be vigilant we need to know uh, why that's not okay and the best way to sequester carbon is to restore right relationship it's not to you know mechanically or or use high-tech uh, um, machinery to to clear the air of carbon this this is uh, something that i feel really strongly about and Becoming climate conscious, we can do that in our gardening. Um, just stop using the gas-powered um, leaf blowers. That's what, as a community here at Transition Town, Fort Washington, we care deeply about that. We like meditating in, in peace and quiet. Every time I try to sit down at a certain time of the year, it's just really loud. And it's not uh, safe with the, with the pollutants in the air and COVID now. We should all be very respectful of each other and not be blowing things around. <laughs> so that's, those are some of the ways I want to just end our talk with. There's so much we can do. So much we can do when we start understanding our um, lives in context. So thank you for your time. It's now 9.04. And I'm going to thank everyone for staying with us for this long. Thank you. And I'll see you again in two weeks as we address plastic. <laughs>